So now we can move on to the last presentation of today. And it's my pleasure to welcome Hernan Morales, who is currently working at Philips, but who used to work here at UPF some time ago. So, and he's now uh, responsible in Philips Paris in the research group for modeling, modeling of fluids, modeling of solids. So please, Hernan. Well, um, thank you, Bar, really. Uh, can you hear well? Uh, well, thank you for the, the invitation. And, and also, I, I thank uh, the previous presenters because it brings a lot of the elements that, uh, that I'm going to show here and share. Um, uh, so today I'm going to talk about um, Euler and Lagrange uh, solvers um, for, for cardiovascular problems. Um, so in this presentation, I will go through, well, general overview of cardiovascular modeling. And then briefly two examples, one uh, on, on my previous work on, on neurovascular flow, and, and then some, some um, ideas about cardiac flow. So as you have seen in during this summer school, uh, cardiovascular system is, is an organ. The goal is to, um, to uh, permit the blood circulation and the, the transfer of nutrients, oxygen, uh, waste, and all about the, our body. It provides the nourishment and helps the fighting uh, disease. Also, we have seen they maintain the, the homeostasis. And the study of the blood flow was, is what we call hemodynamics. And we have seen as well during this uh, summer school, that the arterial response to the, to the blood stimuli. So if I start running, muscles start to demand more uh, blood, so arteries will react to that uh, new hemodynamic condition or start thinking or, or, or more blood will go to my brain or start eating, then uh, blood will go to my belly. And also it's associated to disease, as uh, we have seen again in, uh, with atherosclerosis, and I'm gonna show you with uh, uh, brain aneurysms. So to study hemodynamics, we have uh, mainly three uh, different approaches. <coughs> so one is pure theory. Uh, we have um, physical principles that we can mathematically express. We have also pure experiment. We have seen a couple of talks uh, with PIB, for example, that provides us uh, a l version of the reality, but it's limited due to the, um, to the devices that are, are, are able to measure. And also we have the numerical modeling. And what numerical modeling can offer <coughs> us, so basically we have full control of the experiments, so it's very nice. I can set up my uh, boundary conditions, I can change my flow rate, I can measure wherever I want to measure. It's very cheap, it's portable. Um, I can test unfeasible conditions, for example, I can make my heart beat faster, or slower, or I can put a device, I can test a drug, and there will be it will mean uh, uh, um, a harmful uh, effect on the on, on, on the patient, on the, uh, on the virtual uh, patient, and of course it's reproducible. How I use modeling, in particular, is better understanding of the physics. So in the first example, you will see that although we consider Navier-Stokes is the governing equation for, for flow as a continuous, um, still is unknown the effects of, of, of those equations on complex anatomy when we have a stenosis or we have an aneurysm. I'm going to use that information to uh, provide uh, virtual data so other tools can be developed on top of that. You bring in new information, like the pressure, like uh, stresses on the wall, and also bring this, uh, what, we did, what we were, for example, showing yesterday in, with, the, with the FTA, what is the prediction of uh, endovascular device when it's placed in an anatomy. So what is the recipe for all of us uh, regarding Flow modeling is, of course, we need to define a domain for the flow where it moves. In the case we have, we're interacting with, with solid, we need uh, also the solid domain. We need boundary conditions, so the pressure or flow rate. It's displacement or stresses is, again, FSI is included. And fluid properties, if I'm considering my, my, my uh, blood as a Newtonian or non-Newtonian fluid and, and density. So regarding the uh, fundamental equation, so in this case, we're solving uh, for flow, transport equation, mass, and momentum conservation equations. Um, for a continuous, we need to discretize it, as it was uh, previously mentioned. And thus, we uh, 
bring numerical modeling to, um, into the scene. And I want to uh, highlight two uh, big families of the Ulerian uh, approach that you might, was already uh, very well explained um, by uh, Professor Oñate. Um, it is basically the discretization fixed in a space and is uh, widely used and mainly used for, for flow modeling. On the other hand, we have the Lagrangian approach where the numerical discretization is um, attached to the material. To exemplify this, um, I might regret the next slide, but imagine we have, well, riding a bicycle and uh, we want to know our velocity, pressure, temperature. Um, so if I'm with my phone, I turn on the GPS, and then I can measure and evaluate at each position my, um, my temperature or my, my, um, my velocity. So this is the Lagrangian approach. So it's very intuitive. On the other hand, if someone is measuring what's going on, you need to define, okay, from this tree to this tree, someone is passing, and he's gonna take note of, okay, this is the, um, uh, the temperature of this person, or this is the position and the velocity. So um, forget the previous slide, focus now on this standard way of, of looking at the, the discretization. So we have fixed uh, mesh, and in each of these uh, nodes, I evaluate my velocity or my, my, my property. In the Lagrangian approach, this mesh can deform, and that's bring two uh, examples of fine elements and, and meshless uh, method. So to go from one to the other, so first here I'm writing the, the Navier-Stokes Navier equation in the uh, Eulerian formulation, so mass conservation equation and, and momentum conservation equation. There we have the local derivatives and the convective derivatives. So local means, for example, speeding up the, the, um, at a certain point, um, the, the biking. And convective could be, for example, if there's a slope or there's a sunny area that warm me up, so that will be uh, these two terms that consider the variation, in, in this case, the uh, deceleration. And on the right, right hand side, we have the gradient of the pressure, the viscous term, and the body forces, in this case, the gravity. So to go from, uh, if we use the material derivative, I can go from the uh, Eulerian approach to the Lagrangian approach. So now this term in the, in the, the local derivative and the convective derivatives are just uh, considering one, one single term. So the question is, okay, we have a problem, which technique should I use? So obviously the, the, the answer actually, it's, it's, well, it's, it depends of, of the real question that I want. What is my, my question? What I want to try to answer. So if there's a fluid problem, it's a solid problem, it's a heat transfer problem, it's a combination, is it static, is it dynamic? Which modality in this case is the one providing me the, the data? Ultrasound, CT, MR, uh, 3D array. Um, do I have the patient anatomy, really? Uh, do I have certain boundary conditions? So here are two examples, neurovascular flow and, and, and cardiac flow. So the first one I'm gonna explain to you is how we use uh, our Lyrian approach to solve uh, the universal equation in, uh, for, for aneurysm hemodynamics. So the clinical question is what happened if uh, the physician actually would like to know how many flow diverters that are required to ensure the <coughs> succeed of the treatment. I'm gonna explain uh, the technique, I'm gonna explain the, the, the cardiopathy, if, if you are not familiar with. So aneurysms are this um, abnormal dilatation of the artery, still, on, is, still we don't know yet well which are the, the reason why we have these uh, this dilatations. They are asymptomatic, uh, usually found, we can find it at the base of the brain in the, in the perforation points. And the problem of that is uh, when they break, it can be lethal. So uh, let's say that the physician decide to, uh, that the risk of the, of the, the rupture of an aneurysm is higher than the risk of the treatment, so we're gonna treat it. And in particular, we're gonna use uh, endovascular treatments. The goal of these treatments is um, isolate the, this abnormality from blood circulation by triggering the coagulation cascade. So in the first example, we have endovascular coils, you can imagine that um, if, for example, this is the aneurysm and we have big uh, entrance, without shares, we can move around freely and then eventually leave. But if we put some shares in the middle, in the middle, it's gonna be that 
It's going to be more complicated to, to go through all this, uh, this, this room, and eventually we'll like to sit and stay there um, um, forever and, and clot. So that will be the, the, the first one. The second one, for example, now is still is a big, wide open area, but shares are not fixed, so they can move and eventually they can leave. So this is a complication. So I need to put certain bodyguards trying to block uh, people taking shares out of the, the room. So that will be the, the, the second one with a combination of stand and, and coils. And the latest one is, is uh, maybe I can put many bodyguards at the entrance. So is that not that easy to enter? And if I can, if I manage to go through and enter the room, the room again is empty, but then I cannot leave. So also it's, it's going to be costly to, to leave the room. So this is the, the, the therapy that I'm interested. So as I said, well, eventually the results of the human, the the results, the success of the, of the therapy is going to be highly dependent on, on, on the hemodynamic output. So here I have an example of, of, of ISO velocity uh, for untreated um, conditions and the wall shear stress. If I put, for example, one uh, row of, 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 uh, of shares, I'm going to have a certain reduction, but might not be sufficient. Um, but in fact, plenty of, of, of shares, then the hemodynamic is, is going to be lower, and eventually that, hopefully, uh, is going to trigger the coagulation cascade. So we are, this is the scenario. We have an aneurysm. We decide to treat it. From the treatments, we set flow diverters. The advantage of the flow diverter is it's just one device, so I don't need to put uh, under stress the physician who is playing with the tool. The, the, I can reduce also the, the, the intervention. But it's not clear how many uh, flow diverters should I put. So this is the, um, the question for the physician. So what we see on top is uh, a contrast being injected. And this is an x-ray image. So we can see the, the, the contrast projected and, uh, before the treatment. And then after the first flow diverter, this is what we see. And the physician is actually comparing uh, these two images. And surprisingly, they, they have a, they score, they say, okay, now it's halfway uh, fill it. And they say, okay, it's, uh, they rank it and say, this is um, all right or, or not. They're going to put then eventually a second flow diverter, but they don't know. And of course, these devices are, are costly. But from a hemodynamic point of view, from a mechanical point of view, actually this is, for me, it's scary because the amount of blood that is of the contra that is capable to enter the, the, the geometry is related to the amount of flow that is going through the artery. And actually what happened is because there is a catheter inside that they are uh, creating some damage to the wall. The wall is a bio bio biological tissue that is reacting and maybe uh, reducing its diameter. So actually the flow before and after the flow diverter had changed. We don't know how much, but it changed. So we need to compensate for that, but we don't know actually how to compensate. So this is the uh, available data. So we have very nice, uh, probably one of the best image resolution, so 0.3 millimeters. We rely, we don't have a temporal uh, resolution for, for the 3D uh, anatomy. And then we have a set of, of, of uh, sequence of contrast being injected into the 2D projection. And the assumption is we said uh, because in the brain the artist cannot change uh, out of the, the diameter doesn't change much. We consider okay this is a rigid wall, and based on the uh, spatial resol resolution, I say okay here is my wall. And this is very important because um, it's going to allow me to um, make the assumption of uh, of a rigid wall. And uh, especially uh, the use of Eulerian approach. So most of the studies in, in this um, field using just this approach. No, no, they are not using a Lagrangian approach. And uh, as I said, well, uh, the goal is to quantify the effect of, of flow diverted before and after. So how simulation support that tool? So we run a a lot of simulation in many, many patients. We follow this pipeline, so from the image, we segment it, we limit uh, our region of interest, we do damage generation, solve the equations, visualization, and eventually we need to put a flow diverter at some point. So we ap apply a, a, a remeshing, and then we run uh, the simulation again. 
I'm going to go through three articles. The first one, we were interested in the pulsatility of the, of the flow. So for that, we took, uh, we started this project um, four years ago, uh, just seven uh, Anderson uh, of vascular models. And what we did is we varied uh, the flow rate. So this is, as I said, we have full control and we can test unfeasible conditions on, on numerical models. We cannot ask the patient, could you speed up uh, uh, this artery because I want to see the increment of, of blood in your, uh, in your artery. We cannot do that, so, but we can do with the model. So what we did, we scale up and down this flow rate. Uh, we didn't change the shape, but as I said, the, the, mean, the mean flow rate. And with that, what we found, what you see on the left is uh, velocity. On the right is the Walsh stress. Um, important thing is basically, um, here you see uh, pointer. So this variation correspond to different segments of the artery. And this line at the bottom correspond to the velocity at the aneurysm. And here will be the, the Walsh stress. Um, and these are two different cases, or different two, uh, sorry, two different flow rates. So this is more or less, um, so what, you, what we can get out of the simulations. You see what peak systole arise. Run again the simulation. So this enlargement of this surface area is maximum on the artery. We see that this flow takes some time to fill, uh, to fill the aneurysm. So we're curious about this uh, effect. And actually what we observe is if the flow is very slow, you can see on the top, this is the wall system where I'm plotting. It's the first image. Okay, the first image on the on top left is the time instant when the flow rate is maximum at the, at the artery. And then the next image is when the wall stress is maximum and the aneurysm. So what is telling me this is, imagine again the exercise of the, of the room. So now I have, I'm, I'm, I'm in, at the entrance, I'm trying to, I'm in maximum speed, I enter the room, need to come here, touch the wall, and then leave it. So the time that takes, and the energy that I have here, it's not, um, that's it. It's not, has been a delay because I need to recover all this distance. So now imagine that I have someone much faster than me running. That would be the second scenario. So someone that really fast, it can almost instantaneously touch and produce the maximum wash stress. And this is what happened here. So what we, re what we report is the wash stress and peak velocity, it depends on the size of the room but also depends, and this is what you see on, uh, by, the, by the dots, so bigger dots means big aneurysms, but also depends on the speed of the flow rate in, in, the, in the main artery. Uh, so as a conclusion, it's um, previously in, in, in this field, we have been stressing um, the importance of the morphology. So you have a blip, or have a small aneurysm, those has an enormous impact on the hemodynamics, but we are really forgetting uh, the flow rate, the arterial flow rate. And now it's just is add, add an, a, an additional dimension, but we cannot avoid this because this is a biological problem. And the other thing important is, well, the peak system that we believe was the maximum, uh, was the time by uh, when the maximum stresses and velocities occur in the aneurysm. That is not true. Might be the case, but it not, it's not the case. So we need to revise all the literature that we have uh, been producing over uh, the years. And the main conclusion for us, as an industrial application, the pulsatility is very, in, including the pulsatile flow into our consideration, is very complex. So we went to uh, something much simpler. So we time average our results, to include a bit more of the cases. So now we have 15 aneurysms. So I said the same course, but time average. And what we produce, what we observe, something very interesting. So here on the horizontal axis, we have the, the flow rate and the velocity, watch stress, and, and pressure. Interesting thing is I can, as you can see, we can draw a line uh, for the velocity and, and analytically represent re the relationship between the arterial flow rate and the velocity inside the aneurysm, erratic for the, for the watch stress and the pressure. And on top of that, we show that no matter how, how is the shape of the waveform, this law is, uh, this law, this, uh, this, uh, um, relationship is preserved. So as a conclusion of this study, um, 
the velocity, the wall stresses, and the pressure, we can characterize it with this linear or quadratic um, uh, relationship. These measurements, though these quantifications are beyond any patient-specific flow rate uh, measurement because if I able to measure one in at certain point, the arterial flow rate of the patient, that is time dependent. That's going to change. That's not going to be the flow rate for that patient. So again, if I drink coffee, more blood will go to my brain, and that flow rate is going to change. So this curve go beyond any patient-specific flow quantification and, and nicely describe uh, the whole hemodynamic, and I'm able to compare between cases. So the third thing that we did is um, we introduced the stent, the flow diverter. So we include, now we have 25 Anderson models, again, nine pulsatile waveforms. You do the math, uh, well, that creates quite a lot of uh, simulations. And uh, the stent, in order to be able to do this, this uh, amount of simulations, we do an implicit approach for the stent. So we use, instead of classically, it is, uh, the approach is defining where the wires are located. So we use a porous media for that. And thanks to that, so these are qualitative results you see on top, uh, different flow rates, two cases, uh, before the, de the device is placed, and then after the, 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 the porous media is, is uh, turned on, they said. Um, so you see that uh, vortices in the aneurysm are reduced and flow is it's now going, uh, is not entering as much as um, before. And we again evaluate, this time just focus on the velocity because it's actually what I can measure, what I can see from the image, no watches and no pressure. And uh, this law also was uh, applied to the, to the extended condition. So having that, uh, we define the efficiency or, uh, of the flow diverter with this equation, so basically the reduction in the velocity. So as you, see, uh, you can see is um, this equation I'm drawing in the first, uh, the first plot on the left, is dependent on the mean flow rate. So when I have very low flow rate, it matters the efficiency of the, of the flow diverter is going to be higher. But then when I move toward physiological flow rate, which is around 4 uh, milliliters per second in the internal aortic artery, then uh, this variation due to the flow rate are uh, disappearing. And this is what we bring as we use in numerical modeling uh, to the tool that we uh, develop. So this is um, more or less then, uh, so this is um, understanding on the physics. And then on top of that, what we did is uh, we produced some virtual angiograms. So we set uh, a given position, orientation of the, of the virtual x-ray, and then we do this virtual angiography. That goes to uh, our optical flow technique, so I'm not going to uh, talk about that just to the uh, sake of the time. Um, but basically, with this set of data, we can change the orientation, evaluate where this tool was capable to, uh, to be accurate or not. So here are more example of, of uh, because it's a 3D object, we can orient as where, how we want um, on the left, um, untreated on the right with the flow diverter for two different uh, flow rates. So the question is, okay, can we compare? Um, well, directly, no. We need to compensate based on the arterial flow, and that's uh, the end product of, of Philips that now has the FDA approval. Actually, it's, um, it's as follows. So we have an untreated condition on the left. We do two measurements, one in the artery and one in the aneurysm. After the treatment, we do in the same regions, the same um, quantifications. And then we, for each of them, we define the MAFA, which is the aneurysm flow activity. It's not the velocity because, again, it's the projection of all this uh, uh, contrast inside. And we normalize it by, uh, based on this arterial flow rate. And then, um, if this uh, MAFA, now there are clinical studies, we are collaborating with physicians, now they are uh, pointing out that if this MAFA ratio, of course, is below one, it means that the flow has been reduced, it's be, uh, above one, it means that actually I'm increasing the flow, that might happen actually. But now it's, um, we're reaching the, the, the after, after having uh, um, this tool for a while, we are identifying that a certain point, I think it's point, point 0.6, of this MAFA ratio, uh, then we are ensuring uh, the coagulation of, of uh, 
of the aneurysm at, at six months. So to summarize, more or less, to give you, this is a, a message that I would like to also give you, to you. So um, this is how I see a numerical modeling and the gap uh, with respect to the physician. So we have the patient and uh, the doctor knows, get, do some, uh, he does some certain measurements. And when there's not sufficient, well, ask for images. And then he understands the images, of course. And we are also getting some information from the images. So we are, I'm doing my modeling. But if I do this, I need to teach the physician to understand wall stress, to understand pressure, to understand uh, all these vectors and colors. So I need to teach, I need to train, and that is expensive. And you, you hear from others uh, presenting that that is not a straightforward. The physician asks, could you make uh, um, 4D MR, uh, something that looks like uh, color Doppler, because this is what they're used to. So maybe we have to do the same for modeling. So. So instead of doing that, what we are trying to do is this. So don't say that we are doing modeling or don't show all these complex equations, but just give back information to the image. So the physician will be able to still understand what's going on. So summarizing this very quickly, uh, as I showed, uh, I use a Ulyrian approach to understand hemodynamics. We provide ground truth data for testing an image-based uh, tool for blood flow quantification and aneurysm flow assessment. For that, something very important, we need to perform hundreds of simulations. And still, we are not capable to give those tools to the physician. So my second example, this is more ongoing work, so I'm quite new in the cardiac uh, flow aspect. Um, so the idea is now we have different type of image, especially ultrasound. Uh, and sometimes CT and, and MR, as we have seen. And we would like to analyze, for example, vertical structure and quantification of valve regurgitation, these kind of things. So this is our organ. We know it relatively quite well. And we have these kind of images, for example, 2D uh, flow. And the important thing here is uh, when we do these kind of uh, images for, uh, for cardiac uh, assessment, what I would like to highlight is, uh, well, it's a highly dynamic problem, and that the spatial resolution when I have a 3D and 2D are not as good as the previous case. So doing a nice segmentation of, of or an accurate segmentation of, of the wall is not as evident as before. So this is a snapshot of the, the heart uh, model of Phillips, as, um, it's capable to provide up to four, uh, four chambers, as you can see on, on the right. But need to make certain assumptions regarding, for example, the trabeculae and, and, the, and the, the cordae, so the position of the valve, because it's based on a deformable model. And having that, uh, well, as a community, again, we, need to, we like to use uh, numerical modeling to see what's going on inside uh, the cardiac cavity. So what I'm going to show you is, uh, how Euleran and Lagrangian approach have been used to understand cardiac modeling. So this is not my work. As I said, now I'm new in this, in this, uh, um, this uh, field. But basically what we like to have, again, is flow characterization, so vertical structure, mitral regurgitation, for instance. It's a more complex problem, highly dynamic, where we integrate fluid, solid, and eventually uh, electromechanics, uh, well, electric activation. We have mainly ultrasound, Sometimes, uh, well, CT when a, th a, a treatment is, is, uh, is uh, need to be planned, and rarely uh, MR. And for the patient data, we have, we believe that we have the 3D uh, anatomy. And both well, we have, we believe also we have a 2D uh, flow quantification if we use ultrasound. So as I said, this is not not my work, but something that are uh, I think are interesting and important to highlight. For example, if we have a numerical solver using a Ulyrian approach, so fixed uh, mesh, uh, this group of uh, Beluda Mittal have been proposed and been, well, use the immersed boundary method uh, to be able to consider the deformation of the artery, sorry, of, 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 of the left of the ventricle in order to simulate the flow inside. And as a conclusion, what they say, for example, if we consider the trabeculae, 
um, we, we, they observe that the trabeculae helps to to give up um, helps to um, to the flow to go deeper into the into the uh, into the left ventricle. This is what we see in the, during the systole, so it's the third image on, on the top right. And on, on the bottom is without the trabeculae. Again, we can simulate unfeasible conditions. And during the ejection, the trabeculae also helps to squeeze the flow out of, uh, out of the, the heart. This is what you see in the first row. Uh. The second approach is using, again, um, immerse boundary um, metal for the, for, the, for the leaflet of the aorta and uh, a Lagrangian Eulerian, arbitrary Lagrangian Eulerian uh, approach to consider the wall deformation. And the conclusion is mainly uh, wall deformation is important and we can get more uh, physiological um, flows uh, as, as we observe in, in, in reality. The third example I would like to bring is uh, now it's purely uh, uh, arbitrary Lagrangian um, Lagrangian Eulerian final elements approach. It's a Japanese um, team that are able to combine the electromechanical activation of the heart and uh, the flow inside uh, inside the chamber. And what they say is, well, this tool can be a powerful tool, a powerful tool for establishing a link between molecular and, at, and uh, uh, abnormalities in the, uh, and the clinical disorder at the macroscopic level. So, and, and so you can see, sorry. Yeah, this way. Um, so this is not an animation, it's a, it's a, a very nice uh, simulation that you can find on, on YouTube. So it's quite impressive what they are uh, capable to do. So more recently, uh, in this, um, map that I show you from, from the patient to the, to the doctor, an effort to speed up the computational cost. Uh, there are, have been two review papers that suggest that in order to have a ready to run CFD simulation for cardiac modeling, we require around 20, 30 hours of, of, of human work. That is quite expensive. Imagine or consider that we need to run thousands of simulations. You want to really understand something, uh, what is going on in, the, in, 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 in this chamber. So one of my students, uh, Alexander, is uh, proposed this um, pipeline to speed up uh, and to reduce this, this hour to, to a couple of well, minutes. So by doing a non-rigid and, and rigid registration, um, it's able to deform a generic mesh and adapt it. Uh, so this is the, what you can see over there, this generic mesh. Take the ultrasound uh, data, combine both, and then perform uh, the simulation. So, so this is uh, what you see here. It's um, how this mesh was deformed and now take into account the, the, the ultrasound data that is, uh, well, that is patient specific. So and on top of that, we can run the flow simulation. And this is, well, he published, I'm gonna show this in the next uh, FIMH conference. So now some more examples on this case of fine elements and HPH approach. What they conclude is they do, well, they do a comparison. What happened if oh, they were interested in, in, the, in, the, in the valve and the stresses and the deformation. So you don't consider the flow. The basic assumption is, well, I impose a pressure in, 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 the, in the phases of, of, of the leaflet. And, and well, since I don't know the distribution of the pressure, I apply a constant or same for, for all the surface. But if I have the flow, I can have a better distribution of this pressure all along the surface. And they compare that, and the, for the flow, they use uh, SPH. And they, con they conclude this, well, substantial difference in the kinematic when you use fine elements alone or use this combination. And finally, uh, just recently, for example, uh, no, this was recently. <coughs> a couple of years ago, uh, people from animations are integrating a pure F, uh, SPH to see what is the f how is the flow in, 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 um, in the left ventricle. In this case, uh, the data comes from CT. And what they are claiming is now they are capable to simulate one cardiac cycle in, in, in uh, 30 minutes. 
So again, coming back to this uh, diagram, um, I think we are far from uh, teaching, uh, again, a deficient using these models. But as I said before, we were given that arrow, but I think for cardiac, model, cardiac, uh, cardiac flow modeling, we are uh, even not in the uh, state of providing the, that data because simulation is still too complex, too expensive to compute. So as a conclusion of this second part, uh, well, cardiovascular modeling is, well, cardiac modeling uh, is very, very complex. There's, we have flow dynamics and, and solid mechanics. We need to do simplification in order to be able to speed up and then, uh, but still uh, be um, able to uh, provide a reasonable res result. The, optimizing, uh, the optimization of the pipeline or this numeri new numerical method that start to pop up uh, in the biomedical field are interesting um, options. And especially for, ultra, for cardiac um, flow using uh, ultrasound, for me, is the, the key message is, is um, what is your question? What do I want? And especially, um, what is your input data? And, and where is your wall? Okay, so with that, uh, I conclude my presentation. Thank you very much for this nice overview of also different methods for different applications. I think it's really important to choose the right method for the right question. Now, what you also say is like one of the big problems is this, this large computational time. Do you think it's related to the way we do it? Or, and when we speed up, for example, when you go to faster methods, do you lose something in accuracy or in flexibility or so? What's the trade-offs? Is it just that we haven't been using the right methods or that we have to choose which is important and which we can sacrifice? Well, I think, I think that now we have, uh, as engineers, we want the highest accuracy, especially in the academia, we want the highest possible. So we really do efforts that or guarantee that or the numerical method that we choose is capable to provide us the best. But in the industry, the accuracy is not the same accuracy as we want in the academia. So I would say that it, it is because we're pushing to methods that are uh, with the highest accuracy, but accuracy that try to uh, be comparable with the, with the analytical solution that we can provide, but not with the accuracy that is required for a clinical application. So that, I think that, uh, that's why, for example, the use of SPH for flow, for me, is very attractive because it's providing me an overview of, it, of the whole flow, but it, it's, it's weak, let's say, or weaker in terms of accuracy for near the wall or near the, or, or if I want to calculate accurately the pressure, the pressure drop. And when you look at an industrial model to do these things or like industrial commercial model, what, what do you think is the best to say that indeed you simplify it in such a way that a clinician can run it on an ultrasound machine or on a computer? Or do you rather think it would be like some people are doing a service that would use high performance computing and you submit images and you get them back? I think that uh, the first option is, is the, the way to go. But it's still, uh, even that, I will, I will try to do something that uh, does not require a, a user uh, interaction. So the other one, let's say, sending the data to, uh, through a cloud service, and then there's an engineer behind running the simulation for you and send it back, is nice, but it's dangerous because if uh, there's a misunderstanding or there's a lack of well, uh, communication between the two parts, let's say, uh, in the case of FEOPS, that try to uh, predict the position of a TABI device to replace a calcified aorta. Uh, if they, the physician has, uh, decide two positions, uh, they need to provide both to the, to, to, the, to, the, to the company. They need to test both and then come back. And then the physician says, ah, well, but actually the first one I did a mistake and I cannot do that in reality. I need to modify it. So could you do it again and again and again? So that, and I, each simulation takes time, and each, each uh, uh, and the, the engineer might not be in the same uh, in the same uh, time zone, so it can be even more complicated to that. Any other questions? There's a question. 
thank you so much for this very nice talk. Um, so following on the previous question, I was thinking, uh, of course, the simulation, once you have everything uh, set up, you just run it and it gives you the same result if you use the same parameters always. But I guess there is some sort of user dependency part, which is how you generate your uh, anatomical model from the image. So you showed, for example, this nice tool that I don't know if automatically or semi-automatically does the segmentation of the heart. Uh, but what do you think it would be the impact of different users uh, producing this data or uh, you know, when the data comes from different images? Because I guess different uh, clinicians will acquire the images in a different way as well. Uh, so you think this variability in the input data in general for modeling can produce significant uh, differences in the output of the simulation? Or does the simulation have, or the computer, the CFD, have some mechanisms to compensate for that? Uh. Well, completely agree with you. Is if a user, if a, my my segmentation tool is, is user dependent, the simulation is going to give me a different results. And and actually, that is my my kind of uh, argument to use less uh, um, accurate models for flow, because. Knowing really where is where is the wall, uh, is is not solved yet. So it's uh, for 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 brain aneurysms. I would say it is the best situation because we have the best uh, spatial resolution and uh, and 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 the segmentation algorithm works quite well. There's some of them that are uh, automatic. So, uh, but even if you have, for example, different image modalities have been reported that you get a slightly different anatomy and then you, even if you do the mesh independence analysis and you get very nice uh, Walsh stress, uh, um, the error comes from something that is you cannot control, that is the image uh, acquisition. Uh, so if you use uh, MR or you use CT or, or, or 3 d array, then that already gives you some, some uh, errors in, in where is the wall. And we're talking about modalities that has higher spatial resolution than ultrasound. So that's why for me, people working, uh, before I was working a lot on Walsh stress because uh, we, we heard from previous uh, presentation, um, is very important uh, in order to understand uh, atherosclerosis, for example. And then from that, uh, people derive the OSI. But uh, we, from, uh, as an engineer point of view, that is fine. But really, uh, when you talk about, when you talk with the, peop the person is just before you, the one who provide you the, the, the image, then you start realizing, this is what, I mean, it, uh, this is, I just realized uh, in the last year, because I'm working collaborate, closely collaborating with people who work with image processing, that uh, the output of that is not a grant, is not a perfect, uh, unique solution. Thanks. Any other questions? Uh, according to, to your experience so far, so do you think that right now we are in a point that as researchers, as engineers, we are obtaining from the simulation too much data, too much information, and it's a question of the clinician starting to understand how they can benefit from this, or there are still some important things that clinicians are asking for, but we're not yet there. So we need to, there are some important questions that we still have not addressed with simulations. I think well, you make a good uh, good comment, to be honest, because uh, as engineer, we are uh, we believe, for example, uh, Worcester and pressure are the the, um, the the what produce the rupture of, of a failure of a tissue, and there's no proof yet, as far as I, I, I know, that those are uh, the biomarkers that are required for uh, to establish the initiation of an aneurysm or initiation or rupture of an aneurysm or development. So indeed we are providing more data that they can understand without the proof that is, is uh, those uh, biomarkers are relevant. And uh, I forgot the second part of your, your uh, remark. If we, if we ask for that, if there is still like a very important question, like a very important doubt that the clinicians still have, for example, in stand placement, that we are not yet there because we are we're able of uh, generating a huge amount of data, but we still can g not give an answer to that particular question. So that requires more. Th there are many questions, I would say, um, 
it depends on the physician, first of all. So you have to be careful, especially in the, in the industry, that we, uh, you collaborate with a, with a limited amount of people. And those people have certain expertise. So for example, you, you go to, uh, to France when people are really expert on, on placing flow diverters on the vascular uh, device to tools that help them to uh, predict the positioning. But you go to work with Finland, they open the, the head and, and then they put a, a clip there. So it's, it's a different question and, and different interests. So you need to be careful and, and try to uh, be as general as possible and don't be uh, biased by, by the recommendation of few uh, physicians. But I think this is a very interesting issue. Huh? We already have touched it a couple of times. Is because one of the problems is, as a simulator, you can indeed go from the physics and provide all the things that you think are relevant. The clinician will tell you, I'm using this parameter, make it easier for me to, to measure that parameter. But neither what the engineer does on their own or what the clinician is doing might be the best way. And so this interaction, very close interaction, where the knowledge of each of them is being put together, and then that supported by evidence, because in the end you need to provide the evidence. I think that's the way forward. So I think there's still a huge amount of questions which haven't been answered. The problem is also that these questions haven't been formulated in some ways. And it's by very, very close collaboration, as also Javier Bermejo said at some point, it's like you really need to go as a modeler into the clinic, or unless you develop methods, which is something different. But when you want to go to biomedical applications, you really have to closely collaborate. It's not enough to do a simulation and show it to the clinician, and then or have the clinician say, simulate this for me. It really has to be a very close interaction. You have to understand the biology, understand the question, why is the clinician asking this, and then also try to explain to them in probably an easy way by integrating it in images or whatever, try to explain what the added value of kind of modeling uh, technologies is. And this is something which I think is still lacking. This is very, very crucial for our community. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much then. Then that finishes today's morning session. Thank you.